Good evening, folks. Uh, I'm just delighted to be here with you this evening, and I'd like to thank Dr. Stewart for that wonderful introduction and the uh, School of Advanced Research for inviting me to come and speak about one of my very favorite figures from history, both Southwestern history, the history of the Americas, and I, I must say world history, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca. And he is familiar to all of us, of course, as a person who was well known here in the Southwest for exploring our part of the world in the early 1520s. And Cabeza de Vaca, who is this central figure in the slide in front of you, is not known to us at all in terms of his appearance. He comes from a, a, a family in southern Spain in the province of Andalusia. He was born in the, in the small town of Jerez de la Frontera, and we have no paintings of him, we have no sculptures of him. We only have clues from his own writings and from what his friends said about him as to what he looked like. So what we're looking at this evening in this slide is Frederick Remington, the great uh, 19th century American painter, his interpretation of what Cabeza de Vaca may have looked like. And I, I'm very fond of this painting because Cabeza de Vaca is looking off in the distance, and I can guarantee you, after five or six years of wandering in the wilderness of North America, he's probably thinking at the moment, maybe there are some shoes on the other side of that canyon. Maybe on the other side of that ravine I can actually find a shirt. Uh, it would be nice to eat something this week. And uh, how far am I going to have to continue to walk on this journey that my friends and I have undertaken from Florida all the way to Mexico? What am I going to do to get there? Cabeza de Vaca comes from a very distinguished family. They're mid-level nobility, they're caballeros in Spain. The Cabeza de Vaca family has lots of stories told about it, but it is truly an old and distinguished family in Spain. And he uh, was one of six children born to uh, Francisco de Vera, his dad's name was V-E-R-A, and his mother was actually Doña Teresa de Vaca, Cabeza de Vaca. So Teresa Cabeza de Vaca, his mother, was the uh, figure from whom he took his name. And he's a unique figure in the history of the New World because he is the only figure from the age of discovery to have served as a royal official in both North America and South America. We know him, of course, from his North American uh, travels here in New Mexico because he may indeed have come into southern New Mexico as he crossed North America. But he was also the governor of the La Plata province, the second governor in South America. And so he's the only figure from the, the great age of discovery in the 1500s to have served two official positions, North America and South America. But he did something else that was rather remarkable. In the early 1500s, Spanish literature was beginning to bloom in its modern form. There was really no such thing as a travelogue or a memoir. Those forms of literature didn't really exist in Spanish literature. They barely existed in European literature. And so his, his uh, memoir of his North American adventures, which today we know as the Naufragios or the Chronicles of the Narvaez Expedition, is the very first book in American literature. So he could be called, looking out across his canyon here, the father of American literature. In South America, he wrote another book, his Comentarios, which is the subject of my lecture this evening. And the Comentarios were the third or fourth travelogue or memoir written by any of the early Spanish explorers in that part of the world. And so Cabeza de Vaca, along with Cortez, with Valdivia, the governor of Chile, with um, Columbus himself, has a 
part of a four-part claim as the father of Latin American literature. So there's, there's nobody else in history who is like him. And is, if these wonderful distinctions weren't enough, he is also known uh, as the great secular champion of the Indians in both North America and South America of the 1500s. He was the only one among the conquistadors who insisted, walking across North America, that the Indians be paid for everything that he and his companions got from them. And he took that early knowledge with him to South America when he became governor. He insisted on decent treatment for everybody he came in contact with. And he was a man with a vision. In South America, as we will see, he consciously understood that he was part of the process of creating a new society in what today we would call uh, Paraguay, Paraguay, and that that society would consist both of Europeans and Indians as well. So, an astonishing figure from history, and nothing kills him. Everybody in this room, living in Santa Fe, living in Albuquerque, living around this part of New Mexico, is familiar with the outdoors, and we have a lot of hikers and campers, I'm sure, attending this lecture this evening. Uh, I remember when I was a Boy Scout as a kid, our motto was be prepared. We never walked anywhere without a knapsack, without a jacket, without something to eat, without all kinds of emergency supplies. Cabeza de Vaca begins his travels in North America without any of those things. He's absolutely naked and he stays that way for years and so do his companions and they uh, subsist on grasshoppers, on cactus, on acorns. By the time he made the Rio Grande, he was very happy to have corn, corn beans and squash. He said it was some of the best food he'd had and the only square meals he'd had in five or six years. So he's one of the world's greatest explorers and whatever happened to Cabeza de Vaca after he left the Southwest, well, the short answer is he went to South America he was there for five years. He wrote a wonderful book. And the new translation of it, which is uh, I brought along with me this evening, it's available in the lobby after the lecture, is called The South American Expeditions, 1540 to 1545. And it's the, the first complete English translation of his book in 500 years. 500 years ago, this is what his book looked like, Comentarios de Álvar Núñez Cabeza de Vaca. It was published in the, the Royal Print Shop along with his North American book, The Relación, and uh, put together, they began to create a, a picture of his New World travels that was unlike anything that the world had seen before. We think of Cabeza de Vaca these days along with the other Spanish conquistadors, as a man who was, was moving from Europe to North America with perhaps plunder and conquest in mind. But Cabeza de Vaca is actually one of the world's very greatest explorers. He was first and foremost, for all the years he was in the New World, interested in what was beyond the next hill. He was one of those restless people like Sir Richard Burton in the 19th century or Marco Polo in the 13th century, who just traveled and couldn't get enough traveling under their uh, belts. And so he is very well known in South America still. This is a modern Paraguayan statue of him. But his, his life and his adventures after he was here in North America are, are not as well known. He was born about 1488, sometime between 1475 and 1493, we think 1488 in Jerez. He had five brothers and sisters. And an interesting thing about Cabeza de Vaca is he was actually not the first conquistador or explorer in his family. His grandfather was a gentleman named Don Pedro de Vera, and he was actually the conqueror of the Canary Islands. And the way he, he conquered the Canaries in the 1470s, Grand Canary Island to be specific, he got a, a royal commission from the king of, of Spain, the king of Castile in the 1470s, 
to become the conqueror of the Canaries, but the interesting thing about him is that Don Pedro didn't have very much money. So when he talked the king into granting him permission to conquer the Canaries, and by the way, to set up the, the, the first modern sugar cane growing uh, concern there, he began to, to grow sugar cane and process it. When he got that commission or that concession out of the king, he didn't have a nickel to his name. So in those days in Spain, the Moors were still present in southern Spain. The reconquest was not complete. Don Pedro went to his Moorish bankers and he said, look, I've got this, this royal charter. I can actually go to the Canaries. I can make a lot of money. Would you kindly lend me some money so that I can launch my expedition? Because the stipulations from the king were, yes, Don Pedro, I will give you this royal commission, but it's going to take four or five ships. You buy them. It's going to take four or 500 men. You find them. You pay them. You will also purchase all of their supplies and all of their arms. And by the way, if you make any money on the deal, I want a fifth of it. That's the royal quinto. You can keep a twelfth. So Don Pedro, without blinking an eye, said, I'll do it. And when he went to his Moorish bankers, the bankers said, all right, you've got a royal charter. We need some security. How about your sons? Without batting an eye, Don Pedro said, I'll do that. So Cabeza de Vaca's father actually was pawned to the Moorish bankers of Cabeza de Vaca's grandfather, he and his brother. So the first conquest of the Canaries, which by the way was quite successful, was done on the back of Cabeza de Vaca's father's, uh, father and his uncle, uh, who by the way were ransomed back. Don Pedro did make some money. And Cabeza de Vaca grew up on his knee in Jerez listening to these conquistador tales. Well, unfortunately for Alvar Nunez, his parents both died. He became an orphan by about the year 1500. And he went to live with his mother's sister, his aunt, Doña Beatriz Cabeza de Vaca. And he stayed with her for several years. He was the oldest son in the family. He got a job in the Spanish armies of the day who were uh, at war in the city-states of Italy. So Cabeza de Vaca was a soldier from an early time. He spent 10, 15 years in Italy. He came back to Spain where he uh, found employment with the Dukes of Medina Sidonia. And he worked for the Dukes until 1527, the fateful year in which Panfilo Narvaez, another uh, would-be uh, adventurer in the New World, got a royal commission to explore and conquer Florida, modern Florida. And Cabeza de Vaca in 1527, when he's about 38, 39 years old, joins that expedition as the treasurer, and off he goes to the New World. So. Thus begins this phenomenal adventure. Cuba is right down here off the map, and Cabeza de Vaca and the Narvaez expedition actually sail north along the western coast of Florida. They land at various uh, points here in central Florida, and they go north a little further. The ships, uh, the men land on the shore. The ships of the Narvaez expedition continue to the north, they're supposed to meet up with the land expedition, but a small set of hurricanes sets in. The ships never appear. The men are shipwrecked. Narvaez proves to be quite a scoundrel. And the last Cabeza de Vaca and his friends see of Narvaez, Narvaez is on a raft floating along the shore of western Florida's panhandle, maybe uh, as far west as Alabama, and turning around, he says to Cabeza de Vaca and his friends, every man for himself and good luck, and sails off into the distance. What happens is rather uh, unbelievable. Some accounts say the Narvaez expedition in 1527 had 600 members, 600 men, three or 400 horses, all their equipment, four or five ships, everything disappears. The only people who are left 
After several months, our Cabeza de Vaca, another Spaniard named Dorantes, a, a further Spaniard named Castillo, and a, a Moor from Morocco named Estebanico. Those four uh, survivors are all that's left of the Narvaez expedition. They lose all their equipment, they lose all their food, they lose their clothes, they lose everything, and all they know is that if they set forth and go west along the coast, somewhere down here is Veracruz in Mexico. And Cortez has just conquered Mexico seven years before, and so these gentlemen reason that if they make their way west, it's just possible that they might make Mexico. So they begin this, this truly epic journey across North America, and by some uh, phenomenal bit of luck, they actually survive. Cabeza de Vaca's Relacion, the chronicle of the Narvaez expedition, details all of his encounters with the local people along the coast of Texas, in Louisiana, in Mississippi. And the local people are just as, as destitute, it would seem, as the great hikers with no equipment who are making their way along the coast. Sometimes the coastal Indians eat oysters. Sometimes they have nothing to eat but grass seeds. Cabeza de Vaca says they feast on cactus fruit, cactus flowers. Sometimes they eat a few acorns. The party continues to make its way west, and somewhere here in Texas, Cabeza de Vaca begins to hit his stride in a brand new way. He is asked by a local tribe to treat some Indians who are injured, and he pulls a, uh, a spearhead or an arrowhead out of the sternum of one of the local people. He cauterizes the wound, sews it up, and by some uh, great uh, break of luck, the local person, the, the Indian, actually survives. And so his reputation as a shaman begins to grow here. His members of his party are called the Children of the Sun. They walk along with no clothes, no food, no sandals, uh, not much of anything, and they continue to make their way along the coast of Texas. But the, now they're going from tribe to tribe. This, is, this whole expedition begins in 1527, I'm now talking about 1530, maybe 1531. They're here, and they're going from tribe to tribe, and the reputation precedes them, and they begin to develop an entourage. A large group of people follow them. The great mystery about this is that here's the Rio Grande, starts in Colorado, runs down through New Mexico. Here it is, running down the edge of Texas. They come to the Rio Grande, and for some reason, Cabeza de Vaca only has to go two or three hundred miles this way, he'll begin to hit Spanish settlements. He doesn't hang a left, he hangs a right. He goes up the Rio Grande. And to the best of our current knowledge, he follows the Rio Grande north, he comes up into probably southern New Mexico or the El Paso area. He finally finds that it's possible to cross the Sierra Madre, so he comes across over here drops into the deserts in Sonora and Sinaloa and begins to make his way south along the coast. That's how Dorantes, Estebanico, Castillo, and Cabeza de Vaca became the first people to cross North America from east to west. An astonishing story. It took them about eight years. When they're picked up here in Culiacan, the Spaniards they come across can't believe their eyes Cabeza de Vaca tells them we're the survivors of the Narvaez expedition, and uh, everybody says that's impossible. All of you fellows died years ago. How can you possibly be here? And so he describes his journey. By the time he gets to Mexico City, the viceroy is overwhelmed with the uh, importance of this great journey, and the viceroy offers all kinds of things to the survivors. He uh, offers, except for Estebanico, he uh, talks to Dorantes and says, would you like a valley? Can I offer you a stretch of coast? Would you like a hacienda? He offers Cabeza de Vaca the equivalent of a dukedom in, in central Mexico. And he and his friends continue to badger the survivors of the Narvaez expedition with one question, which is, 
when you guys were way up there in the north, did you hear any tales about gold, silver, gems, something like that up there? And the, the Spaniards are resolute, the, the survivors of the expedition. Sorry, we didn't. Nope, we didn't see any minerals. Nope, can't say that we heard of any mines. They just continually are badgered for six months or a year. Finally, one of the Spaniards, it's not Cabeza de Vaca, I think it's Dorantes, mentions to one of the dukes or one of the, one of the viceroy's men, he says, well, when we were here in, in this part of the, the north central part of the Rio del Norte, we heard a couple of local Indians in these villages and they build their houses up kind of high. A couple of these, these guys said that further north there were great houses and they were golden colored. That's all it took. This is about 1537, and uh, the next result, two or three years later, is the Coronado Expedition, which comes up here to look for the cities of gold, 1540. But in 1537, the Viceroy implores Cabeza de Vaca again, won't you stay? Uh, I, I would be happy to have you here in Mexico. We can use men like you. And Cabeza de Vaca said, no, my friends and I have written our account of our journey I would like to take it back to Spain and present it to the king. Here's the king, Charles I, slightly bug-eyed, known for a very heavy jaw. Charles I is Charles I of Spain, Carlos I, but he's also Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire. And he owns roughly two-thirds of Europe his grandfather is Ferdinand, of Ferdinand and Isabella fame. And his grandfather, upon learning that, uh, well, he, he knew quite well, of course, that the other heirs to his throne were out of the question. They had died or they were, they were not capable of serving as a monarch. When he learns and realizes that his grandson, Charles, is the heir apparent to the throne of Spain and is also going to be the Holy Roman Emperor, he has grave doubts. Number one, Charles I, who's about to inherit the entire Spanish Empire, can't speak Spanish. He's raised in Belgium, so he speaks Dutch, and he speaks German uh, rather well, but, but coming to Spain, he won't be able to converse with his subjects. Number two, he has doubts about Charles's seriousness because he thinks he's, he's been raised in rather soft circumstances. And uh, so he raises objections, but when Ferdinand dies, Charles does indeed become Charles I of Spain, and he's Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, at this point in the 1520s, Charles has this burgeoning New World Empire. Cortez has just conquered Mexico. Pizarro has just conquered Peru. He has galleons and galleons and galleons headed back towards Spain, loaded with gold and silver, more money than anybody in Europe has seen since the, the heyday of the Roman Empire. Charles doesn't care. He likes the money, but he's in debt to his German bankers. And he goes to them constantly and he says, I've got another galleon coming in next year could you please lend me 20,000 ducats? Of course, Your Majesty. So he is a spendthrift. He spends more money than he ever gets. He's very concerned about conquering more of the states of Italy and the small states of late medieval Germany than he is uh, with his New World Empire. So when Cabeza de Vaca shows up at the court of Charles I, he has this brand new book. He's a celebrated explorer, and just that, he's, he's a great explorer. And the king receives him in an audience. Cabeza de Vaca gives his report. The king says, may I do something for you, Don Alvar? And uh, Cabeza de Vaca says, yes, your majesty. Um, my friend, <laughs> the late uh, Senor Narvaez is dead. He's perished. I would like his commission to go back and uh, become the governor of Florida. And the king says, I'm really sorry. That position isn't open. I just gave it to a gentleman named De Soto. They're gonna name a car after him in the future. 
So I, Florida is not open, but if you'll kindly hang around the court, stick around for a while, maybe, maybe something will turn up. And Cabeza de Vaca says, sure. So here's a, an impression of his grandfather. So he bides his time, stays around the court. In the meantime, the first governor of the La Plata province in South America is a gentleman named Mendoza. His colony is falling apart. It's beset on all sides with poor supplies and the hostile local people who really don't want to be part of whatever the Spanish Empire is. They're not sure. They don't want to be part of it. So his colony is in terrible trouble, and Mendoza has to sail back across the Atlantic in the uh, space shuttle of the day, the Caravel, the Spanish Caravel, which the Spaniards actually adapted from Portuguese models. This is the, the, the very latest in transportation in the 1530s, and it was a very efficient ship indeed, uh, and could carry a lot of men and a lot of supplies, and could indeed sail across the Atlantic. So Mendoza's on his way back to report to the king. He drops dead in the middle of the ocean. The ship makes it to Spain, the crew reports to the king, and the king says to one of his assistants, who was that gentleman who was in here a couple of weeks, a couple of months ago, he was the guy who was in North America, Cabeza de Vaca, your majesty, call him back in. Cabeza de Vaca goes to see the king, this is 1539. The king says, Don Alvar, I've just had an opening. How would you like to be the governor of the La Plata province in South America? And Cabeza de Vaca, who was always eager to go back to the New World, said, um, I, I, I'm sure I would. And the king says, well, all right, here's the stipulation. You need to rescue my colonists. They're in dire condition. Some people tell us they've gone into the interior of South America. They're not in Buenos Aires, their original settlement. You have to rescue them. The second thing is you have to expand my territory. The third thing, you need to uh, expand the reach of our holy Catholic faith. Number four, you're liable to make some money at this. If you do, I want a fifth of it. And this is going to take you four to five ships, three to four hundred men, two hundred horses, all the supplies for the voyage. You come up with the money. It's 100 percent on your back. And I want a fifth of everything you make. And you can keep a twelfth. Do we have a deal? And Cabeza de Vaca didn't blink an eye. He said, uh, you bet. I mean, yes, Your Majesty, we do have a deal. So he begins to assemble his men. It costs 8,000 ducats to put his expedition together, 30, 40 million dollars. And he begins to uh, buy old ships, build new ships, gather together his crew, do all of that. And the question always comes up about Cabeza de Vaca. How does an orphan kid, one of five children, who is a rough and tumble soldier, who's just spent uh, an enormous part of his adult life wandering across North America, how does a, a fellow like that come up with the money? Only in the last five or ten years have we discovered that Cabeza de Vaca was married. He had a wife. His wife was Maria Marmolejo, and she was the daughter of a converso family in southern Spain. They were a Jewish family. And we suspect that uh, from Cabeza de Vaca's own writings that she actually put up most of the money to put together the South American expeditions. And so after Cabeza de Vaca assembles his crew, gets his ships together, he sails uh, from the port of Seville, which is on the Guadalquivir River, out into the open Atlantic, and he goes south, and there are all these island chains out in the Atlantic that both the Portuguese and the Spaniards have begun to use by the early 1500s. The Azores up here, the Canaries, the home of his grandfather and his grandfather's conquest right here, and then the Cape Verde Islands down here, also Portuguese islands. So as he sets forth, he stops at these islands for provisions, continues to sail down across the South Atlantic, and finally comes down to an island right here off the coast of modern-day Brazil. 
And the island is called Santa Catalina Island, in Portuguese, Santa Catarina. And so here he is, and he uh, launches himself and his expedition in late 1540, early 1541, from that island. So here's a blow up of what this looks like. And in the South American expeditions, Cabeza de Vaca tells us with his, his uh, loyal secretary, and he's a very loyal person, the notary of the colony, uh, Pero Hernandez is his name. He, he and Pero tell us that um, the expedition actually split into two parts. There were still people down here in Buenos Aires, so Cabeza de Vaca sends a rescue expedition down here to see if he can help any of the survivors. But he's Cabeza de Vaca. He's walked across 3,500 miles of North America. The sun can't kill him. Hunger can't kill him. Privation doesn't seem to mean a thing to him. And uh, the idea of marching through absolutely unknown territory straight across to get to the new capital of the Spanish province, Asuncion, which is in the middle of South America, never crosses his mind that that's a problem. So he puts his whole expedition together and wham, marches this direction. And this is very typical of him. He is always interested in what's on the other side of the hill. What's in the next valley? What, uh, what will he find in the way of interesting people to talk about and uh, to perhaps convert and to find out about? We find here that Cabeza de Vaca is an early ethnographer. He's fascinated by the Indian peoples that he comes across. And there are dozens and dozens of tribes, many, many of them, that he encounters as he makes his way through the forests and the mountains, the jungles, and the plains to Asuncion. One of the problems the Spaniards have in the 1500s, folks, is they always know where they are in terms of latitude because they have sextants, so they can tell you how far south or north of the equator they are. What they don't have yet is longitude. So they don't know how far east-west they are. And in reading the several original Spanish versions of the South American expeditions, trying to put together the places and the people that Cabeza de Vaca talked about made me realize why this book hasn't been translated in 500 years. It, just finding places and place names was a matter of years, and these two maps in front of you took me three years to assemble just to show the routes, especially up and down the interior of North America, of South America, that Cabeza de Vaca took. Their second big problem, the Spaniards in the 1500s, is they have no way of carrying food. Typically, their food supplies last two weeks, and then they have to start living off the country. So we find when Cabeza de Vaca is headed toward the interior, on his way to Asuncion, when he gets about right there, they run out of food. And so he comes across cane breaks with reeds, and the, the Spaniards are very hungry. They haven't eaten in three or four days. They pull the reeds apart. They're full of worms. Cabeza de Vaca says, the worms are rather fat. They look pretty good. We pulled out our frying pans and popped a bunch of worms in the, in the skillet, and he said, you know, they went down very well. So they eat worms out of the reeds to stay alive. They also start fishing. They find out very quickly there's an odd fish in the South American rivers that they call a pomfret. We would call it a piranha. So they, they have to be careful about the fish they catch, but there are lots of fish. If they step in the wrong place, there are freshwater skates with electric tails that they step on, and fire ants if they pause too long or take their shoes off in the wrong place. And Cabeza de Vaca says, this was rather discomforting. <laughs> if you get bitten by a snake, we, by a skate, we have a remedy. If you get bitten by a fire ant, it takes 24 hours for the pain to go away, and you have to lie on your side in the mud at the edge of a, of a pond or a lake and spin around in circles. And he said a, a lot of his, a lot of his uh, 
crewmen, his, his troops, actually did that. The other discovery that he makes quickly is that South America has different kinds of animals that he hadn't imagined. There are, he's, as he begins his explorations here in the central part of the, the heart of the continent, he discovers that it's easier to go by ship, and I'll talk about the kinds of ships that he actually built in just a moment. But he's asleep on the deck of a ship in the middle of a river. He explores by water in South America rather than completely on foot, and he wakes up in the middle of the night because his feet are itching. He's barefoot, lying on the deck. He looks down at his feet. They're in a pool of blood. And when he looks closer, he discovers that vampire bats have been nipping the webbed skin between his toes. So that's how vampire bats begin to show up in European literature. So to say that it's, it's easy to go through these forests is uh, uh, one of the understatements of all time. But when he gets to the Rio Iguazu right here, he makes one of the great discoveries of South American exploration. This is the kind of countryside he's walking through for the most part. He discovers Iguazu Falls. And in typical Cabeza de Vaca fashion, he doesn't make a big deal of it. He said, you know, we heard a roar as we were walking through the forest. And then we found a, a misty cloud that rose up off the river, and it went up about the length of two ships into the sky. And he said, this, this fall that we found was rather a nuisance. We had, to, we, <laughs> we had to take our canoes and our other equipment and portage around the falls. He was sort of put out. Greatest river in South America, greatest fall. So anyway, off he goes. Well, he does make it to Asuncion, and he's the new governor. He's an explorer at heart, you'll remember, but when he arrives in Asuncion, he finds everybody basically hates everybody else. The padres are, are fighting or fretting with the colonists. The colonists, the Spanish colonists, are fretting with each other. The colonists are all fighting with various Indian tribes nearby, and the Indians themselves are fighting with each other. And everybody comes to Cabeza de Vaca's desk and says, Governor, you've got to solve this. Governor, we need to fix this. The Spaniards are extremely legalistic. So there are plenty of lawyers in the expedition, and there's a lot of work to do. Cabeza de Vaca is the judge, as well as the governor, as well as the CEO of the colony. So what he begins to do as an administrator is fix all these problems. He's trying as hard as he can to create peace because he keeps telling his secretary, and by the way, he took his loyal cousin along, uh, another Cabeza de Vaca, a guy named Pedro Estopiñan, Cabeza de Vaca. He tells Pedro and he, and he tells the other Pedro, the two Pedros, we've got to get these problems solved because I want to find a connection between here and Peru and we need to get off on our explorations. Well. How do you do that with all of these problems that you have to fix? And how do you go through such a watery country? His solution was, was simple but unbelievable. The Spaniards brought along with them ingots of iron, like gold ingots, except they really were iron. They brought along a, a little bit of uh, leather that they could work with, although there was lots of local leather and they decided to build a series of small boats, small sailing boats, which Cabeza de Vaca calls bergantinas. They're brigantines, they're launches. This is what they look like. We actually have this sketch of what they looked like in Mexico about 1520. These are the bergantinas that Cortez built that sailed on Lake Texcoco as he was uh, assaulting Tenochtitlan. So they are small ships or small boats they have oar locks, they have sails, and they also have tump lines because going up and down a river or across a lake in the New World, if the breeze fails, you row. If you can't row because the river is too shallow, it has too light a draft, you send men off to the shore and they pull the boat, they tug it upstream. So nothing was going to stop Cabeza de Vaca. And from his descriptions, I made this little sketch of the, the kind of, of lugger that he put together. You see the oarlocks there. Here are the double masts. He liked a couple of masts. And he's, he's even got a Latin sail back here, a, a triangular sail. And this is the kind of ship that he armed with light cannons 
and sailed upstream. And he just sent his men into the forests. They cut the wood, they cut the timber, they brought the timber back to Asuncion, and they built 20 or 30 of these craft. They bartered with the Indians and paid the Indians for uh, the cotton sails and all the, the other parts of the rigging, but the iron uh, they brought along with themselves. So in sailing up and down the river, Cabeza de Vaca says, it, he's, he's very dry with his humor. He's off on one of his exploring trips, and he says, well, we have these little light cannons on the edge of the, uh, the holes, and sometimes they're called falconets or versos in Spanish. Sometimes if we let fire with a cannon blast, it tends to cut down on the hail of arrows that seems to greet us <laughs> from the shoreline. Well, <laughs> here's Coronado just about the same time. Coronado launches his expedition into the southwest, 1540. Cabeza de Vaca is doing exactly the same thing in South America, 1540. But here's Coronado's landscape. It's the southwest. Here are all these fellows dressed up in their, their iron. Notice the priest with his skirts hiked up. Cabeza de Vaca has lots of priests along on his expedition, and they are the, the constant background of, of his tale. They cause him endless trouble. They are forever asking him to build a church, furnish a church, uh, let them get more supplies than everybody else, allow them to teach local people in an unacceptable way, all kinds of things. So here he has an expedition underway. This is Coronado's, but Cabeza de Vaca's looked very much like it. And the interesting thing about the uh, infantry and the cavalry of the, the 1500s is that two of the, the weapons that we hear about quite often are the lance that we see here, and then the harquebus, which this uh, gentleman has in this drawing by Jose Cisneros of El Paso. But Cabeza de Vaca combines his harquebuses, which are very early blunderbusses, with crossbows. And the combination of crossbows, which were much more effective, and then the noise that the harquebus made and uh, the, the absolute commotion that it caused, that combination made the Spanish infantry of the 1500s, the best in Europe. There was just nothing and, and nobody that could stand up against it. In addition to that, as we've all heard, the horses astonished the Indians and in some cases frightened them to death. Well, we have harquebuses around Santa Fe. If you go to, to Las Golondrinas, you'll even see people reenacting their use. But in actual practice, you would light a fuse for the harquebus and you would stick it in the band in your hat and three or four fuses would be very good and the harquebus was so heavy you had to have a stand so you'd set up the stand and then you had to of course prime the weapon and cock it and wait for the fuse to burn down meanwhile you've got a whole bunch of really angry guys coming out of the woods straight at you and they're very effectively armed I can't imagine how this worked I mean with, without the crossbows the Spaniards would have really been in trouble. Would you fellas stand still while, I, while this fuse burns down? This just goes on and on and on. But they're nevertheless, in combination with crossbows, very, very effective weapons. Cabeza de Vaca from the beginning in 1540 runs into trouble with the local settlers because the fact that he was the first man to walk across North America doesn't impress them at all. It, it doesn't cut any ice with them. Well, they haven't seen ice in years. It's, it's pretty warm where they are. But his, his arch nemesis, who's another great figure in the South American expeditions, is a gentleman named Domingo Martinez de Irala. And Irala, in Cabeza de Vaca's book, is a villain. He's, he's a really terrible guy. He's extremely jealous of Cabeza de Vaca. And uh, he does everything he can to thwart him. And what he uses is another little trick that the king put in Cabeza de Vaca's contract. What the king told Cabeza de Vaca when he came to the New World was, you're the governor, but the guy who's the temporary governor in this province is a man named Juan de Ayolas. And we think Juan is dead, but we're not sure. So if after you mount your expedition and you get there, Juan is still alive, too bad. He's the governor, you're not. 
Well, Juan de Ayolas disappears up this, uh, here's an old drawing, an old map of South America. He disappears up this river, makes it all the way to Peru, comes back down the river, and who's waiting for him, who's supposed to be waiting for him, but Irala. Oh, Irala abandons the port on the Paraná River that he's supposed to stay at and leaves Ayola to, Ayolas to be slaughtered by the local Indians. And so, in a, an indirect way, I, Irala did a, a very good, I'm sorry, the, uh, Irala is the gentleman's name. He did Cabeza de Vaca a good turn in getting rid of the real previous governor, but Irala is the lieutenant governor. And he resents very much that Cabeza de Vaca has shown up on his property, his territory, and one of his best men is a German soldier who is in the Spanish armies, uh, in the army actually, technically, of uh, Irala, and his name is Ulrich Schmiedel, and Schmiedel can't stand Cabeza de Vaca and thinks that Irala is the greatest guy in the world. And he, by the way, he writes his own book about what happens in South America. So as Cabeza de Vaca goes about his way, his explorations in, in Paraguay, he uh, is accompanied on one expedition by a series of Indian allies, they're Guarani Indians, and a series of Spaniards, and Irala hires two local Indians to shoot Cabeza de Vaca with a harquebus. They manage to do this during a big ruckus. A jaguar jumps out of the forest, and everybody screams and runs in multiple directions, and the two assassins take that opportunity to shoot Cabeza de Vaca. They're successful. They shoot him through the jaw twice. He says at the end of that chapter, this irked me somewhat. <laughs> this irked me somewhat. It doesn't kill him. It's like everything else that has ever happened to this gentleman. One of the reasons he's one of the greatest explorers in history is not that he just covers so much territory, it's that his longevity is amazing, he can't be killed. He's unkillable. So, Cabeza de Vaca writes reports back to the king, here's Charles. The king's been in office for 10 years, he writes great reports of the colony, and the king says, thank you very much, I appreciate it, I'm on campaign in Germany right now, have you found any gold right soon? Thank you very much. So he pays no attention to Cabeza de Vaca, and Cabeza de Vaca says, we're converting rapidly the local Indians. This is <laughs> a contemporary portrait of what some of the Indians looked like. They're called the Sherbs in Schmiedel's book, um, and we're not quite sure who the Sherbs were. The local Indians in this part of South America typically lived in longhouses that looked like this. They would build a fire in the middle, they often left the sides open because it would let breezes through. They cultivated nearby fields. They're tremendous farmers. Cabeza de Vaca says, labradores de calidad. They're really good farmers. They sleep in hammocks. And even in the 1530s, hammocks are a, a novelty to the Spaniards. They're beginning to appreciate them. They don't know too much about them. Cabeza de Vaca sends out some of his trustworthy captains to the outer edges of Paraguay, the Rio de la Plata, to do uh, general explorations. One of them is Hernando de Rivera. Here he is visiting the Jarayes Indians, and here he is, and he's being received by the Jarayes. The Spaniards say very interesting things about the Indians. If they uh, uh, want to talk about how difficult it is for a local Spaniard to be a good administrator if he works for Domingo de Irala, what they say is, Irala and this, this local gentleman let the Indians do whatever they want, including murdering a lot of people, and they, they do that quite frequently. And in Cabeza de Vaca's book, we see a very clear example of the legend of the Amazons, the female warriors who live by themselves in the woods and once a year go to the neighboring village to visit the men. After they've had a party or two for a night or two, they slaughter the men and they sail back to their home territory. And these are the namesakes, of course, of the 
uh, uh, Amazon Basin and the Amazon River. Here are modern longhouses. This is a modern photograph from 20 or 30 years ago. The housing, which is made of reeds in this part of South America, has not changed much. But it is the rivers that begin to enchant Cabeza de Vaca. He's, he's very much taken by them. And he's taken by this idea that if he can get his local colonists to act like regular people creating a new society, uh, in, encourage them to pay the Indians for foodstuffs, for land, for, for textiles, for those kinds of things, he can actually create a new society. He never questions the fact that it's going to be a Spanish society or that the Europeans have every right to be where they are disturbing these folks. But he, he has this vision of a new society that's peaceful in which everybody is paid for provisions and paid for supplies. And he becomes the great secular champion of the Indians in the 1500s. Father de las Casas is well known from four or 500 years ago from his chronicles of the conquest as the great champion on the clerical side of the Spanish colonization of the Indians, but it is Cabeza de Vaca who also advances this vision. With guys like Irala and Cáceres, this also didn't cut any ice. The Indians were fishermen. They were people who lived in tribal situations. They were people whose natural antagonisms with each other could possibly be exploited, and many of the colonists told Cabeza de Vaca, we're, we're actually here on a conquest, we're not here to pay for everything. And Cabeza de Vaca said, get it out of your head, you will pay while I'm governor. Well, off he goes into the upper reaches of the real Paraguay. He actually establishes enough peace to be able to explore up toward Peru, which is over here, and to begin to make this long anticipated connection between Pizarro's Peru and the Rio de la Plata. And everything begins to go wrong right here at the headwaters of the Rio Paraná. In 1544, there's a, a mutiny and a rebellion, and Irala is, of course, behind it, and uh, Cabeza de Vaca and several of his, his loyal subjects, his, his uh, administrators, are thrown into prison in Asuncion, and he's kept there in abject uh, chains. He uh, talks about how moss and grass grew in his room. There was no light. He becomes very thin and very emaciated. Of course, he doesn't die. He's Cabeza de Vaca. But he's, he's in dire shape, and the colony is in, a, is in a complete uproar. One of the chapters in his book, three or four chapters from the end, he says, how they took over my colony and put everyone who was not of their opinion in the stocks or on the rack. And so he writes to the king, here's Charles on his charger. He's uh, going up a hill in Austria, hoping to win yet more European territory. And he, he talks about what's happened to him and Charles says, well, okay, I'll, I'll have to wait for the other report from who's that guy who's the governor now. Well, I'm the governor, sir. Well, no. Uh, We'll have to wait for Irala to report. So he is in a difficult situation. There's a terrible mutiny, and, and it has come about because he's tried his best to create an equitable society in South America. For 400 years, this particular piece of parchment, which is found in the archives of the Indies in Seville, has been used as an indication of Cabeza de Vaca's family crest. But when you read this old uh, paleography here, what it is is the mutineers writing up a bunch of trumped up charges about Cabeza de Vaca. They created this, this wonderful little family crest because they said Cabeza de Vaca wants to make himself the emperor of the Rio de la Plata. And look at this, your majesty. He's, he's got his own crest here, and he has added cow's heads right to the top of the shield. So what further proof do you need? And when you read 
tome after tome, history after history of Cabeza de Vaca, this thing appears as the Cabeza de Vaca family crest. Nothing could be further from the truth. This is the mutineers getting him in trouble. So what happens to him? Well, there are lots of doubters in Spain about whether he's guilty or not guilty. And he's still in prison in uh, the Rio de la Plata. The mutineers try to kill him. They appoint a cook to cook his meals. And they ship him from Asuncion downriver to Buenos Aires, not in a caravel, one of those big ocean-going ships, but in one of his little launches. His launches will go from that wall to the center aisle of this room, and they send him back across the Atlantic on that launch. And as he's traveling, the cook is cooking up really nasty meals for him. The cook tries to kill him with the other mutineers with arsenic. So there's arsenic put in his food for week after week. But, Cabeza de Vaca says, luckily, I had an amulet, I had a locket around my neck. And I opened it up, and I had the powdered horn of a unicorn inside. And I mixed the unicorn horn powder in with their evil potions and saved myself. <laughs> so he also was very smart. He and Pedro Hernandez, his secretary, got together, and they wrote their version of the account of the mutiny, and they hid it in the timbers of the brigantine as it was sailing back across the Atlantic. So. Off they go back towards Spain. In the, uh, there's a, uh, something straight out of Jonah, the tale of Jonah in the Bible that happens off the coast of South America. There's a tremendous storm. It goes on for days. Cabeza de Vaca says the mutineers changed their mind. Obviously, it was a, a divine sign of their evil intent that they were unjustly imprisoning me, so they let me go. And we arrived at the Portuguese islands in the Azores, we arrived at Terceira. We went to see the, the governor of Terceira, the, the, uh, the Portuguese governor, and we told him our account. He gave us more supplies, and we set sail uh, once again to Spain. But between the Azores and Spain, the mutineers have another change of heart. All of a sudden, they're going to be the first guys to get to the king to accuse Cabeza de Vaca of malfeasance. He's going to be the first one to get to the king and exonerate himself before anything happens. It's a mad race to Spain to get to the king. The only problem is when you get to Spain in 1545, no one knows where the king is exactly because there's no national capital. The king moves around. He's in Valladolid for a few months. He's in, in uh, Toledo. He's uh, off and running in Valencia, and he's sometimes in Madrid. So they finally get to the king at just about the same time, and there's a tremendous ruckus, and the mutineers file two lawsuits against Cabeza de Vaca with the Council of the Indies, accusing him of malfeasance. Well, Cabeza de Vaca isn't going to take this lying down. He writes his own petition to the crown and the king, and this is one of the only documents we have in his own hand. There he is signing his name. And he files two countersuits. So if we have four suits going as of 1545, four suits in front of the Council of the Indies. The mutineers say, you're a terrible governor. We removed you for cause. Cabeza de Vaca says, you're all mutineers and you need to be hanged. This goes on for 10 years. Lots and lots of court documents, lots and lots of cases here involved. Finally. If you read the great 20th century uh, biographers of, of Cabeza de Vaca, like Morris Bishop, you get this romantic twaddle. And Bishop was a good biographer, but he just couldn't let it go. At the end of his great book, The Odyssey of Cabeza de Vaca, he says, 1930, and so Cabeza de Vaca was found guilty by the king. He was exiled to Africa for all of his terrible malfeasance. He came back to Spain. He was never recognized by the court. He was, was never able to regain his good name, and he died poor, broken, and lonely as an old man in Spain. Well, it's all poppycock. That's nonsense. What we now know is that Cabeza de Vaca won his suits. He won his two lawsuits. 
but the, after 10 years, this is 1555, and uh, one of the ways he did it was to sit down with Pero and write his memoirs. He said, uh, gentlemen, we've got to uh, put the story straight, and we have to tell our own version of it. Let's get it published in the royal print shop. Remember, he was a, a member of the nobility. He could do this, and we'll tell our case in public. So he actually does that, and when the outcome of the case is known, the Council of the Indies says to him, Don Alvar, if we reinstate you as governor, you're going to go back to Paraguay, and uh, what will you do to Urala and all of his friends? And Cabeza de Vaca says, what do you think I'm going to do to these guys? And they said, that's just what we thought. So we're reinstating you as governor, but you can't go back. And by the way, Cabeza de Vaca says, they took all my property. They stole all my property, and they distributed it among their friends, who they got to sign these petitions against me. What about my property? The Council of the Indies says, well, we, we don't really deal with property. Sorry, thank you. Goodbye. So he's reinstated, but he doesn't get his property back. And so the tale of Cabeza de Vaca comes to an end. His book is published in 1555, the South American Expeditions. It comes to an end about 1559. He, I think, was thinking about South America and all the wonderful people he'd met, the places he had been, and what he becomes a lobbyist for his hometown in the court of the king. And we think our best knowledge, uh, most accurate knowledge right now, is that he actually goes home to Jerez after walking across all of North America, exploring half of South America, and dies in bed at home. So that's the tale of Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca. Whatever happened to him? Well, I don't know. One of the world's greatest early memoirists, the father of American literature, one of the greatest explorers in history, a great humanitarian, especially by the standards of the, the 1500s, and certainly one of the Southwest's greatest figures. So thank you very much. I appreciate you coming this evening.